everybody to the Business of Speaking show. I am your host, Tim McDonald, and I am joined by a very good friend of mine and special guest that I'm so honored to have with me, Shri. How are you doing this morning, Shri? Delighted to be here. First time on your show. Very excited. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And for those of you who don't know what the Business of Speaking show is, it's really a show where I try and get the story of not what the speaker talks about in front of people on stage, but their journey on how they got there and what they've learned along the way. So with that being said, Shri, tell us your story of how you got started speaking. Wow, started speaking. I uh, So my background, let me just tell folks, I uh, was a professor of journalism at Columbia for 20 years in the Graduate School of Journalism. And right now I'm a professor, a visiting professor of digital innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism. I have the title of the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation. Marshall was an incredibly influential, legendary business and financial reporter and editor in America. He ran money and fortune magazines at various points in his career. And so I feel the burden of having his name in my job title. In between those two jobs as professor, I was the first chief digital officer of Columbia University, the first chief digital officer of the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the third professor, uh, chief digital officer of the city of New York. In that last job, I followed in the footsteps of two awesome women and uh, I, all of that work that I've done has involved speaking in some fashion and being out there and uh, being uh, using my ability such as it is to communicate to do the work that I needed to do. So speaking has been something that's been part of the work I've done for a very long time. Yeah, and I and I've I've met you ever since you were at the at the um, at Columbia. So I'm just kind of curious. Did, was there you know because I I know when you're you know talking to classes and being up in front of people that is speaking. But do you remember like the first time that you ever had to get up like outside of that you know setting that you were used to and just be in front of a room of people and what kind of feelings you had and you know how it led up to you know how it's you know what you learned from that. So I think we should step go a little bit further back. Uh, my father is an Indian diplomat, uh, and he and his uh, uh, and my wife and my, and my mother live in Kerala in India now. They retired there. I know they'll be watching this live or later. So hi, mom and dad. Sorry, I'm not with you. And uh, also, my dad just had his birthday, so I, I'll say hello to him. A second greeting, and Father's Day is coming up. So as you can imagine, uh, lots of emotions around uh, being away from family in the middle of quarantine. And uh, my one of the things that Indian parents, some Indian parents do is they uh, want to show off their kids as a lot of parents do. And my dad was uh, grew up in a uh, very modest circumstances in a house with mud walls, no indoor plumbing and uh, and no electricity and grew up to be a Shakespeare scholar and before he became a diplomat and he instilled in us love of Shakespeare. And so at a very young age, I had to learn Mark Anthony's speech uh, from, uh, uh, Ju uh, from Julius Caesar. And uh, I had to uh, learn how to say, this is a famous, my, you know, lend me your ears, uh, friends, Romans, countrymen speech. And I might've been five or six and I was forced to learn it and had to, uh, at, at dinner parties, I'd be brought out like a, uh, a you know, attraction and uh, forced to do this. And uh, then I arrived in America at the age of nine. I'd grow, that was the first part of that story was all in the Soviet Union under my dad's uh, job there. And then we came here and I learned the Gettysburg Address for school. And uh, here we are today on June 19th, uh, on Juneteenth, talking about the end of slavery and connecting it to Abraham Lincoln and Gettysburg and that speech there. And I remember that was the first time I, I had learned something and was, uh, you know, I keep saying forced, but uh, strongly encouraged, let's say, by my parents to uh, be a good speaker. And so memorized the speech and gave it in front of Miss Donovan's class at PS6 uh, in uh, Manhattan, public school number six. And she uh, instilled in me uh, that love of storytelling and love of, uh, of speaking. And uh, I did that, and she was a teacher who 
uh, inspired us, you know, very modest uh, resources, even in an Upper East Side, New York City school, public school. So she was a tennis player. So she would give us tennis balls as, as in sort of gold stars for things we did well. And how well you did depended on uh, the what kind of reward you got depended on uh, how well you did and the quality varied. So you got a used tennis ball if she thought you did something well. If you did something really well, you got a brand new tennis ball. And if you did something exceptionally well, you got a can of brand new tennis balls. And at the end of that, she gave me a can of brand new tennis balls. And this was from her own money. And it inspired me to know that I could do the speaking thing without being you know, the threat of parental uh, discourage, uh, you know, disappointment. And uh, that's how I got started on speaking. Wow. It's, it's so nice to hear a story like this because almost everybody kind of walks into it in another way. And you're like the first one I've talked to who had it instilled in them from a very young age. Um, <laughs> so as I, as I look at, you know, and, and knowing you, um, I know we first met in person when you were at Columbia and you were hosting, um, it was a social media one night stand, I believe. And, you know, you've always been kind of doing these things outside of your work and creating events. Um, so when did you have that idea and what kind of brought that on? Well, first, let me, I should have started by saying congrats on the business of speaking and uh, understanding the value of what you're doing right now is just, I'm so, I'm so proud of everything you're doing here, Tim. And uh, we met because of your stature as uh, director of uh, community engagement. Uh, the title might've been a little different, you'll correct me. The title of, uh, you ran community, you the community's editor for HuffPo. And this was at the heyday of HuffPo at the very peak. And you were responsible. Part of the success of HuffPo was the fact that it had all these great communities, plural, right? It wasn't a single community that it had built. And, uh, and, 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 and since we're all speaking so quickly, I just wanna make sure that people understood, we said social media one night stand and not just a, we met at a social media one night stand. That's a critical uh, prefix to the one night stand because it might be confusing for folks. So let's explain first of all what that is. <laughs> that's the name of my conference that I've been running for many, many years. Uh, it's a kind of one day event. It's, uh, uh, you know, I'm trying to, I was trying to say it's more than a, a one hour show. It was our one hour session. So I called it a one night stand. It sometimes went three, four, five hours of, uh, of deep dive into social. And I would have stars, social media stars come in and speak at, uh, on the, on the program. Uh, Brian Stelter, uh, it was an early, early speaker uh, uh tim was an early speaker and that was a quality of the folks we were able uh to bring in and have them uh do so you know help everyone understand we had uh, soraya darabi who's another star on online uh she was the, f the one of the first social media managers at the new york times and has gone on to an incredible career cover of fast company etc and so these were the quality of people we got and that's how we met tim and then Tim, you hosted us at, at HuffPo, a group of uh, my students and uh, others came down to uh, watch and learn from you and was so impressed, even, what, I mean, you're a great speaker yourself, but how you engage the audience, the community. Uh, one of the things I've learned from you is that this is not just about yourself as a speaker. You have to bring people, to bring them all, gather them, involve them, give that back and forth as much as possible if you wanna be successful. Yeah. And, and so um, you, you started doing all these events kind of, you know, outside of your, you know, position at the organizations that you were involved with. And, you know, now you're doing it like you're not working for another organization outside of being the visiting professor. So what, what is, you know, what kind of drove you to that? What have you kind of learned during that whole process? Great question about how to think about what, what you do with your, you know, whatever ex expertise or talents you might have. Uh, we, so now I run a company called DigiMentors and we are a, a social, digital, and now virtual events company. Because of everything that's happened, we have pivoted and we are now doing dozens of events for 
people around the world, companies around the world. We just did something called T4, the number four, the letter T and number four, the world's largest gathering of teachers in history. 100,000 teachers registered from 88 countries, 25 speakers uh, that we had. It was uh, an amazing one day, six hour conference. And it all started with an email from a WhatsApp message from someone to me saying, I have a crazy idea. And we launched in one month, uh, maybe 34 days from a, a message to uh, going, going live and having a huge success. None of that is about us. It's about the moment that we're in. And we use uh, the speaking part as I believe a great way for us to bring people together and uh, help them all get better. I think one of the side effects of the pandemic is we've learned the value of how you present matters, right? Like this is something we've talked about for years that being a clear communicator wins you business. Being a clear communicator keeps your business alive no matter what the industry. And we're seeing that uh, kind of taken up several notches during the pandemic because there are too many Zoom calls too many other uh, distractions, too many ways in which we're exposed to people. And uh, what, what we say about social media, and I've been saying for years about social media, social media doesn't make you. Social media doesn't make your brand. Social media amplifies who you are. If you're good, you can be great. If you're great, you can be awesome. But if you're bad, you'll be awful. And if you're a bad speaker, you'll be awful. But if you're a good speaker in this time, you can be great. If you're a great speaker, you can be awesome. And that's what is happening at this moment. And that's why you're jumping onto this and, and seeing the moment for what it is, is amazing. So I, and I know you've been doing online work, you know, while you were still doing in person, both your events that you hosted and when you actually spoke at events. So, you know, and you know, the New York times read along every Sunday morning is a perfect example where you, I believe just started that doing it on Facebook live. And now it's turned into being on just about every platform and, and, um, so many more people tuning into it. Um, how, you know, what have you learned through that process that really helped you kind of, you know, just doing it on Facebook live at the beginning to, turning it into this virtual event management and production company? Yeah, I, I think the most important thing that everyone should do is practice, right? Like we all need to get better at this. No one's perfect. No one gets this right all the time, but just the act of doing it again and again and again. And I think even for your own show, you've been, you started by doing things recorded and then you went live and then you, you know, you mixed it up. You've been doing, and you just get better. The technology gets better. The tools get better you get better. And so what we have done is five years ago, I started reading aloud like a crazy person, the New York Times Sunday edition, the print edition, because I love print five years ago. So the fifth anniversary is coming up this year. And uh, for the last two and a half years, we've made it into a proper show with uh, producers and uh, teams of speakers and I mean, teams of uh, folks putting it together. And then we have exceptionally great speakers from around the world who've joined us. And uh, for example, this coming Sunday, the print editor of the New York Times will be with us, Tom Jolly. Everyone should follow him at Tom Jolly. And we'll be reading the print edition of the New York Times together. He'll be at home, I'll be here. A year ago, we went to his home and read the New York Times together. Uh, this week, uh, this the, during the pandemic, we've had guests like Harlan Coben, worldwide number one best-selling author. Uh, he has three Netflix shows on at the same time. He, uh, he's just an example of the kind of speakers we've been able to have. We had Amy Verschep, the travel editor of the New York Times, join us to read the New York Times. So I tell people, find something you're interested in and practice doing something with it. And that will help you get better. And then when you're ready, you can think about pivoting that into something that's a business in itself or using the skills that you learn for the business part of what you want to do. And that's what happened with the read along. We learned that and now we have advertisers, sponsors with thousands of people around the world who watch anyone we've ever asked to be a guest has always said yes, but it didn't start that way. It started with me just taking up, picking up my phone and just talking into it and showing the New York Times. That's all it was. And now it's grown over time, but with the intentionality of making it into a community. And that's what we have been able to do. 
Yeah. And when you, and I love the fact that you talked about this was something that you practiced and how you started. Cause if anybody is just watching you for the first time on one of your New York, you know, times read alongs, they're going to look at it and go, man, I want to be just like that. But it didn't happen just you know, by you starting that way, it was years of you would just like you said, with your, I remember those days with your phone, switching the view from you to your paper and, <laughs> and back and forth. And, and, or, you know, you did a great job of engaging people, by the way, while you're doing all that, which is amazing in itself. But um, you said something interesting as you've expanded and kind of built a team, you know, to help you with these. And I, you know, I'm not asking you to reveal too much, but can you kind of, you know, let people know kind of what, you know, what the, the framework for that looks like and how it helps you and why you have it set up that way. Uh, sure. In fact, I'd love to reveal as much. I mean, it's not very exciting, but we will certainly um, show you some of the stuff. So if, I, if it's okay with you, I'll share my screen and I can show them uh, some, some of the magic uh, of what we do. So Absolutely. this is our uh, virtual events production brochure that we, uh, that we have. And uh, this is, I, I mean, Tim, you know this better than anybody, the value of being together in a space, right? Like this is my social media weekend, uh, which we do every year. This year was virtual, but um, you're, you're not in this photo, but you've been in others where, where we're like this. We do this group photo and you see me in the front and right behind me is Craig from Craigslist. Uh, next to him is Ali Velshi from CNN and uh, my colleagues, Liz, uh, Liz Barad Wright and Linda Bernstein right in the front. And all of us, this is the magic of, of, of events and why we have speakers and all of that. I like to say that at our, my conferences, everybody could be a speaker. They're that good, the quality of the people there. But we pick out some people and put them on stage, but everybody is sharing. So anyway, how do we replicate this online and what are the things we can do? So I'm, I'm not going to show you the events that, we're, that we've done, but I wanted to show you the production team since you asked about it. And this shows you the New York Times read-along production team, and you can see the hashtag. And again, this Sunday, 8.30 to 10.30 a.m. Eastern time, Tom Jolly, the print editor of the New York Times. So what you're seeing here is we use a tool called StreamYard that allows us to be on multiple platforms at the same time. Uh, while I'm doing Zoom calls all the time, and this is based on Zoom, one of the problems with Zoom, as we know, is that it's hard to control. Every, every time someone coughs, they call on screen. It's a meeting that's been put together. What we do is a show, a television show with chirons and banners and logos and all of that that we can do. And then we bring in comments from Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, all at the same time. And this is our production team. Neil Parekh is our wonderful executive producer of the read along. On my right is uh, uh, Steve Taylor, uh, who is in Philadelphia, Neil's in Washington. Uh, we see Julia Weeks in the red glasses on the right. Uh, she is in New York, in Brooklyn, in New York. And Paula Kiger uh, with the headphones is in Tallahassee, Florida. And it takes these five people to put together that show. But what I love about this picture and why I'm showing it to you is you look at the bottom, it says, uh, Rosemary Aquilina, love the show. Thank you for inviting me. That's one of the most influential, important people that I've ever met. She's the judge who put away Larry Nasser in the USA gymnastics scandal case. And she was a guest on our show. And she's saying, thank you for inviting me. Love the show. We captured that at the end of the show. And that shows you something that you've been successful, not when you've just had a great speaker, but when the speaker is happy, then you know that that will mean more people will join us. She will recommend us to other, other speakers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, this, this is the village that it takes to put together what we do. That is fantastic. I, I, and thank you for sharing that. That, that really is, is helpful. And knowing that, you know, the, the tool and, and for those that don't know, you know, there's different, as Shri had kind of mentioned, Zoom's great for a lot of things. If you want to do more of a, a show, then getting into something like, you know, using StreamYard where you can broadcast it out to different platforms and have more controls is, is fantastic. Yeah, and this is, and then we, we're driving everything to YouTube also as a recording, as a recorded platform for things. And uh, YouTube is hard to build an audience on because people come, but to get subscribers is hard. I think it's, you can build, uh, you know, you can do all kinds of things on it. But for, uh, for example, I can, uh, if you'd like me to talk about my, uh, my uh, daily program, you know, today's the 100th episode. 
and uh, this is the show that we we do and it's just a lot of work to build these but look at you know you can do a playlist i love youtube and i decided uh, at the start of this pandemic that i'm going to use the pandemic to work on something i'm telling everybody hashtag work on something and i decided to work on my canva skills and to work on my uh, ability to uh, learn YouTube better. We're all consumers of YouTube, but creating on YouTube is so much di so different from anything else. And I know Tim, you you're doing that as well. Yes, it has been interesting, and I see we both uh, use TubeBuddy as well, which I just started uh, after one of my guests. Uh, tune me in on that. So um, I'm learning some of the same things that you and and you and it is exciting. I mean, and I hope what people are taking away from this is, you know, that practice that you mentioned earlier. I mean, you're doing your hundredth show daily show in a row that you started at the beginning of this this COVID thing. And it just it's really nice to see, you know, you just don't start something and give up. You commit to it and practice and evolve as you, as you go. Oh, yeah, thank you. And that's what we all need to do, right? We we all need to work on this. So I'm, I'm youtube.com slash Srinan. I'd love folks to look around. And if you have any questions at any point, you're absolutely welcome to ask. You know, when you start a show, you want to be as modest and as humble and as, as the show obviously will be when you start and be just very, you're not doing this for a million people. You're doing it for yourself. And you want to do a, the best possible job and keep it as simple as possible and then you want to grow and grow and grow when we started we didn't say we're going to be having a hundredth show let alone the 99th episode was the chief scientist of who in the middle of this pandemic was our speaker and that tells you something about what you can grow into right you don't have to start with your best speakers you don't have to start with your most ambitious ideas to start simple and just keep moving that's one of my other lessons from all of this is keep moving, keep learning, and just plow forward in what you're doing and try to get better every time. Ask yourself, what are the three things you did well? What are the three things you did badly or you got wrong? And how do you fine tune it and keep going? And a big shout out to our producers, uh, uh, Rosemary, uh, Rose Horowitz, I'm sorry, Rose Horowitz 31, and also uh, Vandana Menon, uh, Vandana underscore Menon. Those are their Twitter handles, Vandana underscore Menon and at Rose uh, Rose Horowitz 31. Please follow them on Twitter. They, uh, I, a lot of people say to me, how can I help you when, we, when, when I'm doing something? And I say, jump in. We don't know where it's going, what's going to happen to it, but jump in. And they did. And for 100 days, they've been helping and working with me. And we put, we've done some really good work and we're proud of it. And when we started, there was no money. I say to people, I'm out of the asking favors business. I'm in the giving favors business, absolutely. But I'm stopping asking for favors. Come in because you're going to learn something. Come in because you're going to watch it grow. And when money comes in, we'll get, we'll pay you. And we've been able to do exactly that. Every show, we have two or three ads that have uh, come in, sponsors. It's not what they should be paid. And it's heck, it's not what I should be paid. But we just keep rolling. And that's how we're, we're doing it. The other reason we're doing this, and you asked about the value of speaking or doing these kinds of things, is that uh, we are able to show people that we do talk shows, right? So it's like an ad for my speaking business and as well as my uh, events around, um, around the uh, ability for us to do virtual events. And we've gotten so many opportunities. People say, oh, I like that show. How do I do it for, for us? And so we work with some of the biggest brands based on that. And so the value of things we do aren't always obvious, but there's value in doing them for yourself and just say, I'm doing this for my own audience and just for me. Let's see if I can keep improving it. And then if you have good content and you have a good audience, first of all, if you have good content, a good audience will develop. And then if you have both of those, then people will put marketing dollars there. One of the things I learned, Tim, marketing dollars are sitting on the sidelines. They're looking for things to invest in, looking for things to put their money into. And uh, these kinds of shows are relatively inexpensive. So I'm always encouraging people to uh, look at doing them. 
Well, fantastic. And I know we're getting close to the end of our time, but before we, you know, get to the end, I have one other question for you that I like asking because it's, it's so important, I think, for people that are looking to do something like this. Um, if you could give somebody looking to get into the speaking business, and we know the speaking business is much more than just getting up on a stage. It's doing these shows. It's, it's doing workshops. It's, it's everything that you just have talked about. But when, if somebody is looking to get involved, what would be one piece of advice that you would give somebody? Yeah, I, I would say just do it. Like uh, start offering, go to everybody you know, or, uh, send out a note saying, I'm available to speak to your audience about my skills. Uh, and today expertise matters more than anything. And having expertise is what will get you booked. And once you get booked, then you build, you know, you go on bigger and bigger stages. I've been blessed to speak at the biggest stages in the world, including South by Southwest, and the Recode Conference and, uh, and the Met Museum's main stage and uh, things like that. Uh, um, and all of that started because I was willing to speak at the smallest stages in the world for no money. And I, uh, that's what you do. I mean, this is the same principle on doing these shows that if you're not willing to do it for zero dollars and zero audience, you will not be able to do it well for all the audience and all the money in the world. And so offer to speak to your kids kindergarten. It doesn't matter, right? And I'm not putting down kindergarten because it's very important. But this I'm saying to speak everywhere that you can, anybody who will have you. I have seen people who I have worked with because I've, you know, I'm an old guy now. I've, uh, I've, I've taught, been teaching for 25 years. I've seen my students go from young, lost, kids, kids, you know, grad school, so they're a little older, but young people lost or just finding their way in grad school to becoming superstars on television, uh, commanding uh, five, six uh, figure speaking gigs, uh, all of that. I've seen that all happen. And it all happens to people who work hard, right? Like that's the thing. When people say to me, oh, like I have a, a really good friend named Asim Chabra, who's at CHHABS on Twitter. And he gets paid to watch film all day because he is a film critic and just an amazing uh, speaker. Uh, he gets invited all over the world and people watch him and say, oh, so lucky. He's so lucky that he, he gets to do that. There was zero luck involved. I mean, of course there was luck involved, but he made his own luck, right? He uh, went to school on understanding film. He may not have actually attended cinema school, but actually went to school on studying the topics understanding what they are and just years of years of, of, of working in and toiling with no gain and uh, uh, appearing to have no gain, but just working very hard and building his expertise. And this is my message to everybody. Your expertise is your fortune. Your expertise is your ticket to being a successful speaker. Uh, I, I can, sh I'll, I'll just show you here. We did an event uh, about two years ago, where I hosted a, uh, an event we called uh, Rock the Mic. And this was my public speaking workshop. And uh, we had uh, Simon Tam, who had a case in front of the US Supreme Court, and Joey Chen, a longtime CNN and Al Jazeera America star. Uh, we, 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 we wanted to understand two things. How do you do public speaking? And how do you do interviewing? Those are two very different but connected skills. And this was two years ago. And um, we learned so much uh, doing this. Uh, people, uh, you know, some of the tips that came out that they, you know, focus on impact. Uh, even if you're not naturally comfortable speaking in public, it's possible to learn. We're all required to be live performers and engage with our audience. So these are all uh, tips that your audience can use from two years ago. Find your purpose is another, uh, this thing. Uh, comment here. So all of this you're, you're seeing, uh, this is an old hashtag now, two years old, but uh, this is exactly the kind of work you're doing, Tim, and inspiring people to uh, share and post so people can uh, see this and, and, and learn from this. Uh, if you have to figure out what your voice is before you choose the state to communicate, so you have to figure out your, what your voice is, figure out your expertise, figure out your voice, Public speaking like a rock star was what Simon was doing. And he'd be a great guest on your show, by the way. Thou shalt not simply trot out your usual stick. Uh, shtick is uh, one of his other tenets. 
you know, find your purpose. These are all things we were talking about. These are our friend Stefan, who you know, of course. And uh, these are all simple things that are obvious to folks, but you have to do it. Just get out and do it. Do a show just for yourself. And by the way, if you cannot get your best friend and best family connections to care about what you do, why would total strangers care and pay you either in time or attention or money, right? And all three is the ideal, right? You want people to pay you in time and attention and money, and that's what you want to do. But do it when you're not getting any of those, and then you will get all of those. I love that. And I actually just shared that similar advice. It's if you can't get 10 people that you know to respond to what you're, you're you know, talking about selling, whatever it is, you better come up with something else. <laughs> so um, to wrap up, tell us, I know we, we talked about your COVID-19 and, and your, your New York Times read along. All those are on Shreenet on, on YouTube. Um, how else can people get in touch with you and what events or programs do you have coming up soon? Well, thank you. That's, uh, I, I love that, that you're, you're so generous in, in uh, uh, letting us uh, talk about what we do. So this is my Twitter handle, it's at Sri, and we'd love for you all to uh, follow. And uh, there you'll see my global show. Uh, you'll also see my email address is right there, Sri at Sri.net, my LinkedIn. By the way, everyone work on your LinkedIn. If you're stuck between jobs, you're underemployed, unemployed, work on your LinkedIn, work on your speaking skills, et cetera. My, my, uh, this, this picture tells you everything about my business and what I do. That's the great Steve Van Zandt. You all know him as Little Steven and uh, also uh, you know, from the E Street Band, but also uh, from, uh, he was Silvio on The Sopranos and he was on the very first Netflix original that he was starred in called Lilyhammer. If you want a gem that most people don't remember, please go back and watch Lilyhammer. But anyway, this is from Social Media Weekend and I earned the right to host him by doing events and things where there were four people and nobody, knew me, right? Like it doesn't happen that you get a worldwide superstar uh, to work, to come and sh speak at your event uh, automatically. You have to earn that right. And that's why I love showing this. Uh, but uh, you can see on here what we're doing. And this is what I said to you earlier. It took us 99 episodes to earn the right to interview the chief scientist of WHO in the middle of the pandemic, as well as the director of pandemics. Like there's a director of pandemics at the WHO and both of them came in the middle of their very busy day. Why? Not because of me, but because of the work that had been put in on 99 other shows. We did an incredible conversation with, uh, with some of the top African-American leaders, writers, thought leaders, and we didn't earn that right by to do that until we had done other shows that showed that we are not just waking up that there's a problem with racial justice in this country, right? We earn the right, and that's what I would say to all of you, earn the right to have the speaker, uh, the speaking opportunity you want. Put in the effort, show, uh, document, track, uh, look at numbers, all of that. Uh, and, but this is also where people who have been on my show have gone on to have the opportunity to be uh, speakers and uh, on television, one of my doctors that I had on a regular basis, she got uh, hired by NBC, Dr. Lippy Roy, uh, and she was seen on our, our stage. So put together documents like this about yourself. Sorry, this is, this is obviously not the document, there, but there you go. That shows you what you're doing. And it doesn't have to be super fancy, but I made this document when we were two shows in and just started collecting things, right? We had Bill Ritter, the, the, the top anchor in New York City on the show, have a card like this where you're again, very deliberate about what you're doing. These infographics are very easy to do. And in the first 75 shows at 155 guests, 91 of them are women, all of this matters, right? Like these are, these are the kinds of things you're showing. Collect these, learn how to collect. I, Tim, I joke around and say the ability to make screen grabs and screenshots is one of the simplest but hardest things to do. And most people don't know how to do them properly. Uh, we have sponsors and then just start collecting. Every time someone says something nice about you, just collect it and just, you may not have anything to do with it or any place to put it, but just look at this. Sri, this, is, this lifeline is something I look forward to daily. Like do it just for yourself. 
like you will forget these moments when you do shows because there's so many comments just fly by all the time. And then hundreds of journalists watch the show for ideas. And then you get involved, you get invited on NPR and people say incredible things from around the world. This is not about me, folks. This is about our ability at this moment to connect and share and post and all of that. And so I just collected these. I, I show how many people are, are using my hashtag. You know, all of this is meant to, to impress uh, sponsors and things like that, but do it because you want to do it. We had one show, Tim, where we had 179,000 viewers. Again, we earned the right to do that because we partnered with somebody. It's not your network. My network will never be this. My audience is not like this. My audience is smaller, but deep and very influential people. My, my rule is it's not who follows you that matters. It's who follows who follows you that matters. So I'd much rather have a hundred people follow me who are influential than have a million followers myself because that's where you can have a lot more impact. So, well, maybe not a million, I will take a million, but uh, you know, I have 84,000 followers on Twitter, which is awesome, but much more meaningfully, my top 100 followers have 200 million followers themselves. So that's what you wanna do. You wanna get influential people to follow you and like your comments and what you're doing. Uh, and then make a document like this. Your numbers will be different. Your numbers may be much bigger maybe much smaller, it doesn't matter. Build it for yourself. Like I was able to find, uh, somebody did this on the internet, 22% of all New York Times staff on Twitter follow me, which is an incredible uh, thing to realize one day when I did. And just track these numbers, they'll get bigger, they'll get better, you'll get better, you'll get bigger, all of that, but just do it, right? Like uh, when I first put this on here, I had very, like my medium numbers were small. I haven't even put my, uh, YouTube numbers because they're so tiny. I've not put them on here, but I will and just put them on and just just get out there and do the work and collect testimonials. Here's a testimonial from LinkedIn, but I've put it here. So content that you get can live in different places and have different uses. And then finally, Tim, I'll show you this list. This is a list that somebody put together of the most influential non-resident Indians. That's an, a term art of a uh, term of art in India. That means people who live abroad who are Indian. And I'm number six on this list. It tells you it's a bogus list because Dr. Sanjay Gupta is one below me. And that tells you something is wrong. But my mom loves this, obviously. So I have it here. And you have to, I, I'm doing, I'm showing you all of this. And I'm, because it's the business of speaking on my regular show, I never show, you'd never show anybody any of this stuff. But uh, the key is do the work, talk, share, show your, your expertise. That's what matters. And I would love, to connect with anybody who needs help, anybody who has ideas, anybody who wants to collaborate. Tim is an awesome collaborator and has done some incredible work for so many years. Uh, anytime I, I've, I've wanted to do something with him, he says yes. Learn to say yes is another tip for all of you. And uh, I, I, I'm just rambling on here. So I, Tim, whatever you need, anytime you need, you know I'm there for you. No, thank you so much, Sri. This has been absolutely fantastic. And I love that you're saying you don't normally show this, but this is what you do to help you create it, something that you love doing and turning it into a business. If you don't have that information, you don't have that body of work, people will not be able to, to you know, know what you're doing and what the impact is. So I just love that. Uh, and I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. Um, and if you're watching live or if you're watching the recording, one thing that I love to do is ask um, our guest one question that we don't show or record on YouTube. And so we only make that available to our email subscribers. If you head over to speaking.business and join our community and sign up for our email list over there, um, there's no cost for that. You just do that and sign up. And each week we'll send out um, a weekly newsletter with one piece of exclusive content that doesn't go to anybody else. So with that, I will say thank you, Shri. If you don't mind holding on with me, we'll get that question recorded. And I just want to tell everybody what a brilliant marketing uh, uh, idea that he, what you all just saw. That, I mean, I love it. So he's uh, giving you a reason to subscribe to his newsletter. Everybody, please go and subscribe. 